Hello. Hello. Hey, everybody. Um, so we're going to talk about common sense ways to accelerate your million line of code build, or your two million line of code, or your five, or your 10, or your 20, or, or your 100, or whatever delusions of grandeur that you might have. Um, I say that because a lot of the companies I've gone to, they're like, we have a really slow, large build. We've got five million lines of code. And then when I go to do the actual analysis of how many lines of code there really are that get built, it's usually like a, literally a tenth of what was advertised to me, which is fine because it makes my job easier. So I'm Matt Hargett. We're at CPPCon, in case you didn't know. Uh, so yeah, so I'm Matt Hargett. I've been programming for a long time. I used to program in BASIC on a computer called a TI-99 4A. I used to type in BASIC programs from Compute Magazine with my mom a long, long time ago. I'm older than I look. I've been an open source contributor for a long time. I first started using Linux at an internet service provider in uh, Springfield, Illinois, which is where I'm from, in the mid-1990s when you could only boot off of a floppy for Linux. You couldn't put the kernel onto a hard drive. Uh, and I've been reporting bugs and, and giving patches and to all kinds of open source stuff. And as I got older and became more successful, also funding open source things that I wanted to see stuff happen on as well. Uh, a number of years ago, I co-authored a book called Pragmatic Unit Testing in C Sharp. Uh, I am pretty language agnostic. Uh, I like JavaScript a lot. I like C++ a lot. I like flat C a lot. I like C Sharp a lot. Uh, the number of languages that I don't like is the easier, or am fluent in, is the easier thing to talk about um, than, the, than the other set of languages. Uh, and just because I'm completely crass, I am open to consulting. If anybody likes what they hear and wants me to come sprinkle my pixie dust, I'm happy to, to do that uh, and have made a good living doing that. I'm also an indie musician, just to be doubly crass. So. <laughs> uh, uh, that's my Bandcamp page, and uh, I'm the making of the making of on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon MP3, Google Play, any digital storefront, basically. Even the Zune store. I don't think it's open anymore, but if it was open, if it is open, then you can listen to my crap on uh, your Xbox 360. Um, so the agenda. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about vocabulary a little bit. I did a practice uh, of this talk at the ACCU in Silicon Valley uh, a month ago, I guess it was. And uh, I was using some compiler terms uh, that people weren't familiar with, and they asked questions about it. So now I just folded it into the slides. Um, and I'll, I'll keep, uh, try to keep an eye on everybody's face to see if anybody's making the I don't know what that means face uh, to expound any further if I need to. And then uh, we're going to talk about if only it were simple to speed up a build for real. Uh, if only like it, uh, so some like really basic things that people just go, well, of course you can speed up build. You just do X. And that slide, that, that series of slides talks about why it's not so simple just to do X, even for very, very simple code bases. Um, then we're going to talk about accelerating what gets built, making what, what's being built faster, reducing what gets built, which it's actually amazing the amount of overbuilding and oh, the amount of disk I.O. that happens that is completely unnecessary in a lot of uh, the builds that I've dealt with. Um, and also culture shifts that result. And this is the, the piece people don't really anticipate or talk about, is what happens beyond once you make this technological transformation, what does it actually mean kind of sociopolitically in an in a even medium-sized engineering organization? So some quick vocabulary. So I'm going to talk about link time optimization, uh, which in Visual C++ terms is link time code generation or a whole program optimization. Um, the way link time optimization works is that when it, you compile source files, they don't get compiled to native code object files. They get compiled to intermediate representation kind of byte codes, if you will. Um, and then during link time, it at link time, it sucks up all those object files of the intermediate representation and then optimizes across all of them. Why is that awesome? Well, the reason that that's awesome is because now uh, inlining across object file boundaries is possible. You don't have to put function bodies into either preprocessor defines on the com command line or in header files just to make sure it gets inlined. Of course, as anyone programming in these languages for long enough knows, 
uh, just because you mark something with the inline keyword or you put it in a header file doesn't mean it will actually get inlined. The compilers are actually so smart now, they won't inline something that will bust the cache in a loop or anything or something like that. Um, profile guided optimization is another thing. Uh, the first time I used PGO actually was in, I think, Visual C++ 2005 beta. It was a long time ago. It was about a decade ago. Um, and uh, what happens there is that it compiles the sources plus some instrumentation so that when you, when you run that code, it outputs these kind of uh, these runtime kind of profile files. Um, once you've exercised your program and you've generated these kind of runtime profiles, you then compile it again, and it sucks up the sources and the runtime profiles and optimizes for the runtime profile. So branches that are taken more often, uh, uh, it knows about those and can optimize for those. But also the GCC, for instance, and I assume Visual C++ does the same, and Clang does the same. Uh, for hot code paths, it will inline more and optimize more. And for cold code, code, cold code paths, toy boat, um, uh, it will optimize for size instead of speed, for instance. Yes, sir? We also use it to do page reorganizations without loading up caches. Yeah, sure. Uh, and there's the struct matrix transformations and stuff like that, too, yeah. Um, really good idea. Uh, I think really anybody who is claiming to care about high performance C++ should already be doing these things. And if you're not already do, doing these things, the trick is to bang the rocks together. Um, so uh, the other thing is talking about mArch, dash mArch, um, generating code for a specific CPU. Uh, it's not just about instruction set, although instruction set is very important, um, but optimizing for what the L1, L2, and if it exists, L3 cache sizes are and what their speeds are. So for instance, many moons ago, right, if you had an L2 cache, it might not have been on die or full speed. Right, you know, a very, very long time ago. And then those L3 caches that are kind of the same thing. There's like some amount of latency to them. Um, also, how uh, pipelining works on that CPU, if SIMD is available, what the cost of SIMD instructions are on that CPU target. So using mArch to optimize code for a native target, um, for, for, for the, the target you're going to deploy on, if you know what that is, is very, very important. Um, and there is a death trap right there, mental note. So I talk about these things because uh, we're gonna talk about how we're gonna use compiler optimization stuff to help them make our build faster later. Uh, I'm gonna introduce these concepts now. I couldn't tell, I had trouble figuring out where to introduce these, 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 these tool concepts. So Ccache is an open source project that creates an on-disk cache of object files. Uh, uh, indexed, more or less, it's slightly more complicated for the, for the purposes of hand waving and getting on with things. It, it, that dictionary of object files is indexed by the preprocessed source hash and the uh, hash of the compiler command line. Um, and it works simply by prepending the ccache command onto the front. ccache, gcc, abstract socket, blah, blah, blah. And then it takes care of the rest. Um, uh, it does actually parse the command line to GCC and figures out how to pull certain things out. Uh, Ccache also, it doesn't just cache the object file, it actually caches the compiler output. So the warnings that were emitted by that compiler for that preprocessed source hash also get output at the same time, uh, which is cool. DistCC is an open source project, I think that came out of Samba, which is the open source implementation of SIFS or SMB or whatever you want to call it. Um, and it distributes compilation by transferring preprocessed sources to other nodes where those other nodes then kind of translate the preprocessed source into object files. Um, yeah, and that's, that's what that kind of comes down to. Uh, so there is a dist ccd that runs on those remote nodes. You can have them configured with zero conf, so you don't have to have like a hosts file that you explicitly define. Um, stuff like that. So Ccache is caching, and distcc is distribution of work. Ccache just runs on one machine. So if only, if only it were simple. Is my mic level okay, by the way? Good? All right, great. Uh, if only it were simple. Well, you just talked about Ccache and distcc, so let's just use those, am I right? No, unfortunately not. Um, so both of those tools, 
more or less depend upon pre-processing the source code using whatever preprocessor and compiler it is that you are employing in your, in your source tree. Um, so what that means is that those tools aren't going to work very well for you if preprocessing is slow to begin with. Right? So preprocessing is like the first kind of bottleneck that one has to kind of deal with and try and optimize builds. You might go, what about native code optimization and all this other kind of stuff? If you look at white paper after white paper and where people are trying to solve these problems, it is in the preprocessor. Um, so uh, things that make preprocessing slow, giant transitive closures of header includes. Right? And this is one of like my, my pet topics that I talk about a lot um, because it's a huge problem, not just for slow builds, but for encapsulation, packaging, and all these kinds of things in general. Right? One of the things with fast builds is it's, like it's all about modularity. The more modular your code is, the more you can parallelize your compile, and the more you can parallelize your compile, the shorter it's going to be, hypothetically, in a great hand-wavy kind of fashion. Um, so uh, uh, header files are really tough, uh, especially if you're using very template-heavy classes that where a lot of the implementations are in the header files themselves, and therefore they also need to include a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, another big one is slow network I.O. Uh, so front, front end of any build is checking out the source code. If that's slow, then your build's going to be slow, whether you're in, you're in a continuous build situation or some other kind of uh, conti continuous integration tool, tool chain. Uh, DCC has to transfer preprocessed source across the wire. Yes, sir? Do you have a question? Oh, okay. Um, uh, so if you have to transfer preprocessed source across the wire to those DCC nodes, if there is a 10 megabit hub in the middle of there somewhere, true story, then uh, you're going to have a problem. Uh, so local, slow local disk I.O. I'm going to use disk in quotes and you'll understand it a little bit. Uh, 4200 RPM laptop drive doing, uh, I, don't, I don't care if you've got like a eight core, hyper-threaded, whatever. If you've got that slow of a drive, you're, you're going to be serializing on I.O. almost all of the time. Um, uh, let's see, unnecessary include in library directory searches. So on the command line, that's the dash capital I and the dash capital L. What a lot of people do in their make files is what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Boom! And then you end up with giant command lines of include and link and, and library kind of paths all of which gets statted every time something needs to be done, by the way, every time something gets included. Uh, and that can actually slow things down a lot, especially if you're doing it on a network file system that is suboptimal in some way. There's a slide where we're talking about network file system stuff. Um, the other thing is unwittingly invalidating the Ccache cache. I'm using Ccache or some other mechanism, commercial tool, open source tool, proprietary tool, whatever, to do this stuff, there are ways you can screw yourself out of that cache working for you. And we'll talk about some of those, some of those things as well. Um, another thing is that DCC needs a fast local network. This means doing it from your laptop over Wi-Fi is really just not going not gonna to work, period, full stop. Yes, 802.11n, 802.11ac, da 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 There's lots of startups making wireless really fast, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's not going to work out. When you go to do a make-j32, you're going to saturate that 54 megabit, assuming that you had the whole 54 megabit available to you to begin with, which you don't. Uh, you're going to actually saturate it extremely fast. It sounds really fast when you're like streaming Netflix or like BitTorrents or something like that. It's actually not fast when you're trying to massively distribute a compile. Um, so, so yeah, so this is why just using this CC or just using Ccache doesn't quite work out. You can get some gains by just approaching them naively and just going, boom, I'm done. And your build will probably be a little bit faster. But in my experience, it's not, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of a letdown where it's like, oh, I thought it was going to be a lot faster. So we'll talk about <clears throat> how to kind of measure some of those things. So let's talk about accelerating the work. So we're going to talk about making the source checkout and update really fast. The, the real kind of, the real takeaway for everybody is RAM disks, RAM disks, RAM disks. Um, using the gold linker or any linker that is threaded and can like spread across multiple cores and can partition in any way whatsoever uh, is a huge win. Um, uh, optimizing the compiler for your environment. Uh, optimizing remote file system servers and clients is another huge, huge thing that's easy to do 
uh, if, if you have distributed, uh, if, if you're already working in kind of a, a networked compile fashion. And then part of accelerating the work is parallelizing the work. And then we're going to talk about using, using C cache and using this, this CC. So make the source checkout fast. So how about this? Everyone go to your work and just do a simple transfer rate test on a checkout from your main repo. And if you have, if you have teams that work across multiple geographies, have them all run the same test and see what happens. Uh, you don't have to get really fancy with this. Just like time a checkout three times from a couple of different geographies and see what happens. Um, another thing is to do a simple manual load test with concurrent clients. So do that first thing, but have 15 of your buddies all do it at the same time, not over Wi-Fi, but over a wired connection and see what transfer rates you actually get. There actually are open source tools. Subversion itself has its own kind of like little benchmarking kind of suite inside of it that you can kind of, if you build Subversion from source, you can kind of get at those things. Uh, that's one way to do that. Or you, if you, just to make the barrier super low, just, just try it and see what happens, right? And then time it, do a, do a DU on that directory structure. How much stuff did it actually just check out? How long did it take? That's the kind of ballpark that you want to kind of look at. Um, I, I mentioned, uh, I alluded to a story a little while ago about the 10 megabit hub that was in the middle of whatever. Uh, that's a true story that happened in the early 2000s. The uh, team was growing very fast, and the checkouts just took forever to the point where, never mind like taking a nap when the build was happening, like just going to check out the code, people would go and like you know, I don't know, play street hockey or something. Uh, and it turned out that uh, this very well-funded startup um, that had grown organically in their network in infrastructure had spent tens of thousands on gigabit switches, which were really hot shit at the time. In the early 2000s, it wasn't totally ubiqu ubiquitous yet. But it didn't matter because uh, the, uh, the, the thing that was running the CVS server, pretty sure it was CVS at that time, uh, somehow was connected to a 10 megabit hub that was kind of hanging like off of like the rack mount with like the AC adapter kind of like strewn across and trying to trip burglars or something. Uh, another example is um, going to a company, go to do a checkout. This is really slow. You guys only have a couple megabytes of source code and this is taking like minutes. What's going on? And I'm like, where's the server? Oh, it's under Alice's desk. All right, Alice's desk. And uh, there, it was a 100 uh, megabit uh, hub, but uh, all of the, her cube mates around her were all hooked into it, and someone had a bad ethernet card that was causing collisions, and so, bam. Uh, the nice thing about these stories is those are dumb problems, and the nice thing about dumb problems that I love is that they're easy to fix. It's like, great, I'm gonna spend $50, I'm gonna go to Fry's, I'm gonna get a switch, so, <laughs> and then stick it in there, and then we'll figure out who's got the bad ethernet card from there. Um, monitoring source control servers. Uh, some of this stuff just gets really operational. And that's just what it takes to like, make this stuff fast. Having Nagios or whatever you want monitor CPU utilization, RAM utilization, uh, disk I.O. saturation, any use of swap. Uh, one of the last companies I was at uh, not too long ago, this is a big problem on their subversion server. They had a pre-commit hook that was running on the server. It was a server that was about six years old, but they hadn't kind of upgraded the hardware to keep pace with the actual growth of the engineering team. So they had more and more of these pre-commit hooks running in parallel on the server, which saturated the RAM, caused it to swap, and then game over, right? Uh, not game over like the server melted down, but because then the disk I.O. was pegged, and then when the disk I.O. was pegged, it wasn't actually able to service checkout requests very efficiently, et cetera. So making the source checkout fast <clears throat> is pretty key uh, to this whole kind of life cycle. Uh, so speeding up compilation itself, I have it checked out. Let's say that that's incredibly fast. Um, the main thing is to mount temp as a RAM disk. And you can do this on Windows as well. Percent temp percents, whatever it is, you can overlay, you can do whatever. Uh, figure out wherever it is that Visual C++ is stashing shit and make it a RAM disk. Um, if you go, well, uh, you know, the developer laptops, first of all, getting a laptop and trying to make a laptop be fast for these kind of compiles, 
yes, we can make it faster, kind of like it's kind of like cutting off your nose to spite your face a little bit to say like we want to make a MacBook Air compile really fast. Um, nothing against MacBook Airs, I have one, I like it, but I wouldn't try to do high performance, highly parallel builds on it. <laughs> um, so, uh, but some people have very large source checkouts, and even when you do a subset of the checkout, like uh, some very large search companies do, and things like that, there's things you can whittle it down, but it's like I still can't build within it. Well, the main thing that is really I.O. heavy is the link. So if you can at least put your build output in the RAM disk, you'll still win a lot. So if your sources are on a spindle or an SSD and your build output is on the RAM disk, that'll still help you a lot. It's the link that is the killer uh, as far as disk I.O. is concerned. So if you have to choose one or the other, uh, you know, certainly choose the build output and the link stuff all happening within the RAM disk if you can, if you can uh, swing it. Um, so uh, using tempfx on Linux, which is kind of a no-brainer, but uh, I did work at a company where someone was like, no, we should be using XFS in the RAM disks. I was like, I don't know why a journaling file system matters in a RAM disk, because if the power goes out, everything's gone anyways. But they're like, no, it'll be more performance, and so um, this was a politically powerful person in the organization, so I spent a few days benchmarking RAM disks, and tempfs is just faster. Um, in case anybody had a, had a question about it. Uh, feel free to try it again, though. Like, don't take my word for it. You know, things change, kernels change, whatever. So uh, um, RAM disks, the best bang for the buck. Even the bestest SSDs, you can EFDs, whatever you want to call them, that you could possibly think of. Nothing's going to be faster than like the raw bus speed, period. Now, I did have, this is actually the same person. It's going to be a pattern here. I did have someone try to argue with me saying, no, 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 SSDs are really fast now. I'm like, faster than a RAM disk, please explain. And he's just like talking about all these tricks they do. And I'm like, well, are uh, you talking about a SATA one or a SAS one? Or what are we talking about here? Yes. Well, no. Just think about it for a second and just do some math and look at those speed, those transfer rates and tell me how that works out. And now, of course, there's PCI Express Direct SSDs, and those are awesome. Like the late 2013 iMacs have those, and definitely better than the ones that are going over SAT or SAS, but still not faster than a RAM disk, period. Uh, unless, for some reason, you've got like a 15K RPM, like SAS disk, or some crazy EFD, like direct PCI Express, in a machine that is, you know, running like, you know, DDR1, you know, like 200 megahertz DDR RAM or something, then, yes, it's feasible. You could construct a scenario where, uh, in fact, the SSD is going to be faster than the RAM disk. However, uh, you're an idiot for putting that machine together. I'll just say. Bold proclamation. Um, so one thing that you can do, though, is use PCI Express direct EFDs or SSDs as a backing store. So SSDs have a place. I'm not against SSDs, but bang for the buck. Um, and what I did at a couple of companies ago is I got SCSI disks, SAS disks, SATA 3 disks with native command queuing, latest Linux drivers, old Linux drivers, uh, SSDs. PCI Express SSDs didn't really exist at the time, at least not for less than tens of thousands of dollars, so I couldn't test those. And RAM disks, uh, and I tried in different versions of Ubuntu. I've actually got this notebook of this grid of crap that I tried. Because at that company, we were trying to figure out what was the specs of the new developer workstations going to be? Where were we going to spend the money on those workstations? And what kind of disk? A 15K SAS disk is actually not cheap. And the storage size isn't that large. So it was like, OK, is that the thing to do? You know, and we don't care about thermal necessarily, but if 20 developers in a small cubicle area, well, in, in, in a enclosed area all have those things spinning, will noise actually be a problem? Will we have to get pink noise generators? Um, this is how deep I go, folks. <laughs> this is it's just what's necessary to solve these problems for reals in, in real companies. So, uh, And after all of that stuff, RAM disks won full stop. And even though SSDs are a quarter of the price that they were then, like they've, they've gotten so cheap so fast, it's, it's really fantastic, RAM disks still win. Um, so. 
uh, one thing is that when you have RAM disks and I.O., it's not just seek times, but throughput, like the actual like, throughput rate of the I.O. is that fast, other bottlenecks can come to the fore, right? Other things can happen, like, oh, it turns out you had a lot of latent race conditions in your make files where things weren't quite hooked up properly or whatever build facility that you use, whether it's scons or GNU make or bmake or cmake or whatever. Uh, a lot of latent problems can come to the fore, uh, and it is not the fault of the RAM disk. Those are problems that already existed. And every fourth Tuesday in April when the bells rung, when it's like, oh, the build just crapped out before it, com before it actually finished. It just, the, ex there was no error, it just stopped executing. Every one of those bugs is that you never fix or never track down is probably gonna come back to haunt you when you're actually speeding up your build in this way. Um, that's a nice problem to have. Uh, to make builds consistent and having a forcing function that makes you makes these things happen more. One of the really nice things about RAM disks, no source code changes, none. So if it's like, well, we have a legacy code base and we are, we're kind of afraid to touch it, which is a totally legitimate perspective to have. Every time we, we breathe on it wrong or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, when, when there's a thunderstorm 100 miles away, all of a sudden, you know, like we get a core dump. Uh, those kinds of things. This is like this is like the tip of the spear. Beyond just making your source code checkout fast, RAM disks are super easy. Every OS you can do it on. You can do it on Windows. You can do it on Mac. You can do it on Linux. And everything else. Uh, so that's really awesome. So you can immediately get a gain, um, assuming that your developer workstations have enough RAM to have a reasonably large enough RAM disk to do this kind of thing. So, MacBook Air is a case in point, uh, has four gigabytes of RAM, which is crazy to think that that's small now, um, but uh, it's soldered onto the motherboard. You can't upgrade it. Like, go try to find it online. You could probably go to like the Maker Fair with your MacBook Air and see if you can like bribe somebody to like, please upgrade this to eight gigabytes. Most people won't do it. Uh, and now the MacBook Pros are kind of the same way, right? You can't upgrade the thing. So MacBook Air maxes out at eight gigabytes. And that almost works if you don't have too many browser tabs open. You can actually make a RAM disk on an eight, eight gigabyte MacBook Air that can build most of the code bases that I've had to deal with in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, MacBook Pros, 16 gigs is the official like upper limit, but I think there's a hack to do 24 gigs or something like that. Or is that the Mac Mini? Um, it's possible that if you're trying to speed up your build and, you're, you're, uh, and you kind of don't do things on centralized servers, uh, I, have a, I have a Mac. I like Mac products. I have an iPhone. I'm not hating on Macs. But it's possible that Macs are not the best choice for your developer workstations. It's possible. Um, so putting that out there. Unless you get the trash can, whatever the trash can is, that has like 192 gigabytes of RAM in it by default. And, yes, sir? No. Uh, no, uh, typically, like, so like all the stuff in user, in, all the stuff in user include and uh, user bin and all that kind of stuff, it's just gonna be in the file system cache almost all the time anyways. I did do experiments actually where like I did take the whole tool chain and put it in the RAM disk and put that on the front of the path. I didn't really see a difference, uh, at least not in the um, kind of 16 to 20 way, make, like make J16, make J20 on uh, 16 processor, Opteron, blah de blah, 192 gigabytes of RAM machines that I was doing it on. It's possible it would make, it, would make a difference on other source trees, but it didn't for me when I, when I tried it on two, two different, two, across two different companies. How do you clean them up? Yeah, so, so the, the question is, is that when you have these RAM disks and these, these kind of temporary directories and you're kind of using multiple builds or you're doing multiple builds across them, how do you, how do you clean them up? Uh, RM, RF, and it's really goddamn fast because it's a RAM disk. Um, so uh, that's a good question, though. Um, unmounting and remounting is something you shouldn't have to do. Um, the flip answer would be to reboot the machine because it's a RAM disk and so everything will just go away. 
Um, very good question. Do you have any, anything else? Oh, it's, uh, cer certainly, certainly. So uh, let's go next. Uh, so optimizing the file servers. So disk I.O. is a big part of builds of this nature. You know, when you have a 500 megabyte C++ binary that's the result, or even a 100 megabyte one, the link disk I.O. is just off the chain, crazy, uh, huge bottleneck. Um, so if you NFS mount uh, your libraries that you link against or the includes that you pull from, or network mount in any way, let's just broaden it to anything, but my direct experience is with NFS v3 and v4 on Linux. Um, uh, one thing that's really interesting that came up at one of the last companies I was at is that they had great switches all the way through from the developer, like the Ethernet ports of the developer, all the way to the colo, it was just greased lightning. But things were still really slow. Um, when reading the, when reading include files or reading like these, uh, these kind of .a files off of these, these NFS shares, it was still quite slow. Uh, and that was very curious. So it wasn't the network, the transfer rates were okay most of the time, but not all the time. Some parts of the day, like it would slow down or be weird. So it turned out that the, uh, I'll just say that it was a NetApp uh, device and uh, its CPU is pegged at 100% almost all of the time. I, I don't know what was going on. I'm not an expert in NetApp or SANS or NASes necessarily, um, but uh, it was totally pegged at on CPU. This is something to watch out for. Not just with NetApp, I'm not picking on NetApp, but just in general, and I would never have thought it, that, that I would, we would have had to have cared about that. It turned out that the CPU in that NetApp head was a Celeron CPU from a long, long time ago, and basically they just weren't scaling the infrastructure as the engineering team or as just the company grew. Um, so it doesn't matter how fast your switches and disks are that are attached to that thing if, this, if it's just going to be CPU limited for some reason. Um, another thing with NetApp or these things in general, just pay for the professional services to come in and tune the thing. Your sysadmins probably have enough to do as it is, and this, is it. These, this kind of stuff is actually very complicated to have to try to figure out. Um, optimizing NFS mount options on clients. Uh, here's just a couple of tips, but you can read about these things online if you do a web search. Uh, large read size and write size values. Uh, you know, uh, even, if you're, even if you are going tr across transcontinental continental links, they're real stable these days. And if there actually is a real big problem, like a shark bites through a fiber optic cable or something like that, uh, it's game over anyway. So. Um, Setting the low timeout and low, low retransmit values, just do it. Um, there's some other options that are Linux specific, like uh, no TCO and stuff like that, that can be very helpful. Um, also, mounting read only. So if you are using NFS, shared NFS mounts as a, way to, uh, as, as a way to kind of publish packages, you don't actually do real packaging, like I would personally recommend, but you just have like dot .a's, new dot .a's that appear on a file share that get updated somewhere. Just mount those as read only, and then you're getting rid of a time, end time, ACL updates, attribute rights, all that stuff goes away. And these are, uh, uh, oh, all that NFS stuff is all stuff I worked through incrementally at two of the companies that I was at to, to speed it up quite a bit. I'll give you the slides. <laughs> uh, you can take pictures if you want those, that's, that's still okay. Um, another thing to keep in mind, and any IT networking person will just say, duh. Uh, Use jumbo frame MTU sizes. Make sure that that jumbo frame MTU size, the 9536 bytes, is at every hop along the way. So it doesn't just get fragmented down to 1536 MTU somewhere in between. Otherwise, the, the point is moot. Once it gets fragmented to be that small, uh, the point is actually moot. Again, best part about this, no source code changes. Doesn't matter, right? This is all like purely pure infrastructure stuff. So now we're going to get into start to get into like things that do affect the tool chain and the source code. So using the gold linker, if you are on Linux um, or Mac for that matter, or I don't know if you're doing uh, if you've hacked your PlayStation 3 or jailbroken your PlayStation 3 and you're using like linkers on that to compile Homebrew or whatever, um, use the gold linker. There is no reason at this time to not use the gold linker. It used to be like, well, I don't know, it works good for Google, but it can't link the kernel and blah blah blah. Um, in C++, if you're doing large C++ code bases, 
use the gold linker, period. Um, so one thing to keep in mind, threaded mode is not the default. If you, so gold will actually launch multiple threads, which will actually help it scale to however many CPUs, virtual or otherwise, are uh, hyper-threaded or otherwise that are in your uh, whatever machine that you're building on, which is awesome. There's also this other neat option that's pre-read archive symbols, which I had shaved 10% off of a, or no, 20% off of a link time on a very large C++ code base that I was working with. Um, another thing as well, and this really is for people doing link time optimization, enable plugins, not just in gold, but if you're using regular old bin utils BFD linker as well, enable plugins there also. Bad news on this is that it's still a compile time switch, and it's not enabled by default in a lot of Linux distros. I don't know why. Um, I, I'm sure it's a political problem because it sure, it's not a technological problem, but I don't know who needs to get spanked to make that happen. Um, so the way that you do this, and just to collect some notes here all in one place for you guys, but obviously do a web search to go deeper on this. When you go to configure uh, bin utils slash gold, you enable gold and you enable plugins. That's not enough though. If you actually want your compiler to use the linker with plugins and for the compiler to be aware that there's plugins, plugin capabilities within the linker, you then have to rebuild the tool chain using that linker. Huge pain in the ass. It's just one of these things where it's just like, this is why you're losing C++. Like this is just silly that people have to go through these kinds of hoops. Uh, maybe this stuff is fixed in trunk somewhere or something, but I still had to go through this same whole shenanigan a set of shenanigans. Now, most people who are doing hardcore, high-performance C++ in a large development organization are bootstrapping their own tool chain. They have their own branch, either because it's a vendor-supported branch, special from Red Hat, Mentor Embedded, Embacosm, Linaro, or whoever, or they're just maintaining their own private branch of GCC so they can cherry-pick certain things. So uh, bootstrapping the compiler in the last couple of companies, I, C++ companies I've been in, is not crazy. They were doing it before, before I even got there. Uh, so gold, gold linker is the big one. Um, so optimizing the compiler for you. So uh, GCC, this is GCC specific, and unless you are a member of the Visual C++ team, you can't compile the thing. So uh, this stuff also applies to Clang as well, but I'm not an expert on compiling on bootstrapping Clang. Uh, but I do have a great deal of comfort bootstrapping GCC. And it's so much easier than it used to be. Um, so uh, when building GCC, there's a couple of things. One of which is that uh, there is a make target. Once you run configure and it makes a make file, there's a make target called profiled bootstrap. This is what you want. You don't want to type make, you want to type make profile bootstrap. And we talked about profile guided optimization at the front end of the talk. <clears throat> and uh, um, uh, basically what profile bootstrap does is GCC does a profile guided optimization of it building itself. So it builds itself to generate a runtime profile and then it uses that intermediate profile generating compiler to then compile GCC again and then it uses the runtime profile generated from that to build itself again using that profile, and then to build itself again. Um, so why is that awesome? Well, uh, profile optimized, we talked about the preprocessor is the bottleneck, right? For even Ccache and DCC, for the most part, the preprocessor is the bottleneck. Anything you can do to make it faster is good. And even if your code base doesn't, isn't representative of what GCC's code base is, having it be having all those branches and all those switches and all those jump tables for the tokenization and whatever be profile optimized just from a spatial like locality perspective is going to help you reduce your CPU time. We already talked about getting rid of IO time, right? So now we're talking about CPU time. How do we, how do we, once IO is kind of most, mostly said and done and taken care of, now we're talking about just like making the most effective use of the CPU because this, the, you're going to be, become CPU bound once you have RAM disks. Yes, sir? So if that's a, just a universal good, why isn't GCC distributed built that way already? It depends on the packagers. So the, the, the question was, if that's so awesome, why doesn't, uh, G, why doesn't GCC maintainers just do that? And the answer is that uh, for some Linuxes, that's exactly what they do. 
So, but different maintainers do different things, and somebody has an RPM script from the mid 90s that they don't want to touch, or who knows, right? Um, also, I mean, it is more time consuming, right? Uh, so, I, I don't know why anybody wouldn't do it, but it would be up to the individual package maintainer. And so, if you pop on to Pound Ubuntu and ask Matthias Close or whoever it is who's doing the Debian GCC packages and Ubuntu GCC, GCC packages now, is it profile bootstrap? If not, why not? Uh, I'm pretty sure that it is on Ubuntu, but I, I can't speak for anything else. Um, the other thing is that there are these build configs. You can see here this with build config equals my bootstrap LTO. So in the GCC source tree, there are these, this is a config directory, and then there's a um, bootstrap-lto.nk. There's also a bootstrap-03. There's a bootstrap you know, whatever. Uh, and the, this is how you go in and kind of change up the GCC bootstrap flags to meet your target environment, whatever that is. So for instance, uh, you can just copy that config file like I do there, and then, and then uh, copy the original bootstrap LTO to mybootstrapltomk, and then you specify it in the configure with build config equals mybootstrapltomk, not without the MK, by the way. Uh, and in there, you can put 03, 0 fast, mrch equals native, um, whatever. Uh, to help speed it up. If you are using centralized servers for all of your builds, if uh, either because uh, uh, um, you have a kind of, no one runs a compiler directly, they run uh, shell scripts, and those shell scripts tell some compiler as a service or build as a service where those, wh what to compile on NFS, um, or, or kind of uh, something like that. Um, why was I talking about that? I'm going to skip over that for time. Uh, so the other thing also is that GCC now builds a C++ natively. I don't know if anybody's nerdy enough to know that. But um, starting in 4.8, building a C++ was the default. But even in 4.7, and I think even 4.6, you could configure it with enable build with CXX to get it to compile C++. Why do, we, why do we care what it's compiled as? It doesn't make any difference to us. It does if we're doing profile bootstrap. Because by having GCC profile bootstrap itself, compiling itself as C++, we're exercising the C++ tokenizers and parsers a little bit. Um, and just so you know, all of these make a difference. I, there's a whole bunch of things I tried that made no difference in end-to-end -end build times that I'm not mentioning. Um, and how much of a difference it makes is really going to depend on your, um, your environment and your, and your source tree. Is that really that hard to read? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Well, that, uh, that has <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, can we try turning off the light back there? Is that feasible? Just for a second. It's just this slide that looks like it has problems. It looked fine with the HDMI when we had, we're using the HDMI instead of the VGA. There we go. Oh, and it's still, still pretty. Mm, sorry, sorry, folks. Uh, what this is is uh, so the the kind of heading here is um, adding a non-functional file to your to your GCC sources. Um, so just to try try to get that profile optimizer like parsing headers that you care about. Um, so this is actually a, a header file in GCC called. It's one of the most generic ones called include hash tab. It ends up getting included everywhere. Uh, include hash tab already had a if def C++ uh, in there so that it could extern see some things. So what I did is I made a patch that's prefaced with my changes, where I'm pound including a specific C++ header, and then I'm doing a static instantiation of something that I use, right? of something that is from my source tree. So I'm doing a static instantiation of a vector of long, long, and calling it template instance we use for realsies. Uh, and what, is, what that's going to do is that that is going to, when I go to do a profile bootstrap, is not only going to be parsing the vector header and tokenizing that, which is cool, and all of its other stuff, but I'm gonna, it's going to have to do a, a, a template expansion right there. And it's just going to get thrown away during optimization. But that's fine. I'm just trying to seed the preprocessor profile-guided optimization 
with stuff that I actually use. This little trick and things like it got me like another like 5% shaved off the end-to-end -end build time of a build that started out at two hours and we ended up getting down to, down to 10 minutes. Okay, the lights can go back on. Uh, another trick here is, uh, sorry, it didn't align properly. Um, but um, if you're using static LTO libraries, so when you, when you do link time optimization, you can have static libs, you can have .a files, but there's not native code in those .a files. It's LTO intermediate representation. Go modify the makefile.in in some part of GCC that is part of the profile bootstrap and just link those suckers in. They're gonna get totally eliminated during the link optimization, which is totally fine, but the fact that uh, GCC is gonna parse the IR for those static libs is gonna make that part profile optimized for your build also. That's another 5% uh, off of the end-to-end -end runtime, in my experience. So what else? Uh, do the same thing for your linker build. Do the same thing for gold. Gold doesn't have a profile bootstrap. On, on, well, it's not a compiler, so it can't profile. It can't bootstrap itself, really. But you can set the C flags to be OFAST, MRT equals native, and have gold use LTO. Highly recommended. Uh, if you want to go to the trouble to make a profile generating version of gold, link your, do your big link, and then use that, I would recommend doing that. I think that would probably be, actually be a huge win. Uh, again, when you, once you've solved the disk I.O. problem by having RAM disks, go look at your big link, you'll see it's just pegging the CPU. It's just completely CPU bound. So anything you can do to make that faster, to, to, to reduce the compute is gonna be better, um, or reduce the load on the CPU. Um, so do the same thing for your static analysis tools. So I'm a big PC Lint fan, but I can't, rec I can't recommend it anymore because it doesn't, hasn't worked w on Linux with C++ 11 code bases for over five years now, and they just aren't fixing it, and so I can't recommend them anymore. But if you're in a flat C code base or you're using Visual C++, then, uh, and you have Flexilint, which is the, the obfuscated source code version of PC Lint, uh, I cut PC Lint runtimes in half by making profile optimized versions of PC of, of, of Flexilint. Um, any open source uh, kind of like code analysis, anything that's tokenization, those jump tables, getting those things in the right order, getting the spatial locality really tight, is just huge, huge on these things. Um, and this is just a little example of how you would kind of go about that. Just one thing, when you are doing these kind of crazy optimizations, just make sure make check still passes. Um, make sure that whatever test suite it is still passes. I personally, 100%, never had any problems using OFAST, using MArch native, using LTO in this way beyond GCC 4.6. GCC 4.6 and above, this has all worked great. Anything below that might want to be a little more conservative. Um, but hopefully you have an automated test suite anyways. So now that we've kind of tried to optimize CPU wise, it's like, well, how can we just cheat? How can we just like not do work at all? And this is where Ccache comes in. Um, I'll make a note for my next slides to choose more contrasty things. Um, so like we talked about earlier, Ccache works. You just put Ccache on the front of the compiler command line, and it does the rest. Um, I then do a ccache-s there, which uh, measures the stats, tells you where the cache directory is. That's my husband's name, because this is his laptop. Uh, how many cache, cache hits there are, how many cache misses there are, et cetera. Um, so pro tip, Put the cache on a RAM disk if you can, but certainly do, do not put it on the network unless, unless you've got a really awesome network and really awesome NFS setup. Um, uh, one of the companies I was at tr said, said, we tried C-Cache, it didn't work for us. It, was, it wasn't any faster. And it turned out that they were pulling out of and going into NFS. Uh, this was the same company with 100% CPU peg on their uh, NetApp head. Um, and that was why. So uh, uh, monitor stats for unexpected cache, cache misses. So compile small parts of your, code, of your source tree. Uh, if you can go to a subdirectory and do a make, 
or going to a sub project and do, do a MS build or whatever using Ccache, see what it does, then compile it again and see any misses that you get. Just same sources, same everything, should be same everything. All kinds of little things will screw you up. Uh, under, under, date, under, 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 file, under, under, little things like that. And you need to dig into the Ccache man pages and it'll give you some hints on how to work around some of those problems. Um, increase the max cache size based on misses. Don't just make a terabyte cache size. Large a cache of that size isn't necessarily helpful. There's other little tuning things that uh, Ccache gives you in its man page. It mentions how many levels the cache directories are and stuff like that. I never had to deal with that level of optimization of Ccache, but I guess other people have, otherwise the, it wouldn't exist um, in there. Um, so let's see, uh, one thing I'm not gonna go into for time, but I would encourage you to learn about its direct mode versus preprocessor mode. It uses direct mode, which is supposed to be faster, but it will fall back to preprocessor mode. Preprocessor mode is slower, and it's, it's a very nuanced, deep thing to figure out to, to try to figure out why that happens sometimes. But there's actually a great community around Ccache. Uh, yeah. So let's see, so parallelizing it. What, what make J n works best for whatever n is, right? Hopefully everybody here knows that just because it looks like you have eight cores in your machine, you don't, right? The way hyper-threading in modern BIOS is presents these things is it presents them as it looks like they're distinct cores, but they're not. Right, so it's typically n minus one or n minus two. This is where the difference between a core i3, a core i5, and a core i7 comes to the fore. Um, core i7 is really what, or not just Intel, but AMD. AMD doesn't do these kind of weird micro segmentation tricks like uh, Intel does. Um, but uh, uh, larger is not always better, right? So if you get rid of disk I/O. And then you kind of minimize CPU as much as possible, the kind of what's underneath that. Sometimes it's gonna be your own make files, your own, the own, your own kind of logical structure of your build, right? And nothing's gonna help you with that except just eyeballing what's going on as it goes by and going, wait a minute, why is that module building before all these other modules? Why are these other modules serializing waiting for this module? They don't even link against that module. Oh, because someone didn't understand make, and they made an edit, and then it turned out that they made, made a huge bottleneck in the system. Making a RAM disk isn't going to help you with that stuff. That's just uh, shoe leather. Uh, there's just no getting around it. Super tedious, but some of the biggest bang for the buck is just good old, you know, instead of like code optimization, algorithmic optimization as far as your make facility is concerned. Um, one thing that I ran into a couple of times with Dell machines in particular, um, Hyper-threading was disabled in the BIOS on a couple of Dell machines that I ran into across two different companies. Make sure it's on. It's, it's, it's a win. Unless you're trying to run like MS-DOS 6.2, which I guess doesn't get along with what something hyper-threading does. That's why they turn it off, I guess, because people run MS-DOS 6.2. Uh, but that's something to be sure of. If you have a laptop or whatever, it's probably good. But uh, the big beefy Dell workstations and rack mounts both had, had these, that exact problem. Um, another thing to do is to uh, do this kind of watch command. You do a watch, updating once a second, PSAUX dub dub, grepping for G++ or Clang or whatever it is that you're looking for, and then making a note when the number of those processes goes below your make JN account for more than a second or two, right? So if I said J16 and all of a sudden that list goes down to three and it's there for like five seconds and it's not a link, something's up. There's something in my make file that I can optimize there. Um, also with LTO, um, when you use LTO at link time, when you supply it to linker, you can say equals n, and that's how many kind of partitions and processes it'll, it'll launch across different cores. That can bring, even though you're doing link time code generation or LTO, that can bring those link times down. Best of both worlds. You can get you know, uh, inlining and optimization across object files. But also, <clears throat> you can parallelize it still. Fantastic. Uh, There's a really good blog post on optimizing LTO. Uh, Hansa, this GCC developer guy who's really nice guy, had this awesome blog post on LTO, using LTO in Firefox. It was just like a few months ago where he talks about RAM, CPU, and optimizing the build times. Uh, 
Firefox is a really good representative C++ code base for giant code bases. So, yes, sir? Uh, so the question was, what do I mean by sometimes less parallelism yields faster results? Sometimes there are inefficiencies in the system that uh, you don't quite realize yet. And so just because you have a RAM disk, fast NFS, and 16 cores or 32 cores doesn't mean dash J32 is going to be faster than dash J24. It just depends, right? So for instance, if you have cryptographic stuff that happens during your build, like uh, major cryptographic operations for some reason, like generating RSA key pairs, or not RSA, <laughs> but generating key pairs or whatever, um, those kinds of things, uh, those can eat up CPU time in a way that you don't anticipate. And so just because you have 32 cores and you make everything else fast, don't assume 32 is the number. Go down, like in inch it down, uh, and see if 31 is faster than 32. I have always been surprised by this. I've always thought, I got it. This was the last optimization. The SIFS component is not building before the whatever. The RAM disk, the NFS, whatever. And then dash J20 is faster than dash J24. And I don't know why. Or, and, and it just depends. It can be very, very specific. There's no general advice that I can give as to why that would be. Um, so let's see, parallelizing the work by using disk CC. Uh, I've had a lot of luck with disk CC, I'll be honest with you. And uh, someone just needs to make a fork of disk CC that actually implements the stuff Google has internally, because they're not open sourcing, and I don't know why. Um, that's just what needs to happen. Someone, just, someone just needs to like, spend the time and money to, to make that happen. So uh, Boost is still a huge issue. Transitive closure of header files is enormous. Lots of template stuff. I'm not picking on Boost. I'm just saying, in my experience, that's been the killer for disk CC. Every, if you look it up, you can find other people talking about this on the mailing list. You can get, see proposed patches to disk CC. I tried those patches, and they do absolutely help if you want to maintain your own private fork of disk CC. Uh, in the organizations I was in, I wasn't going to make that argument business-wise. It just didn't make, didn't make sense. Everything else, once we, even once we, once we did that, disk CC didn't make as much of a difference uh, as we hoped that it would. Um, can be when super, if you have a super fast network between the nodes, if you profile optimize the compiler and preprocessor, the, uh, the header files and the transitive closures are very, very clean. You are forward declaring everything that you possibly can. Um, DCC, I think, almost demands a back end build as a service. I don't think this thing of copying like the preprocessed stuff over the network makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, I, 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 that's the main thing that some companies do with their disk CC forks. That is the difference, and I think that makes all the difference. <laughs> Using C cache with disk CC, you can't just put C cache space disk CC space G++. That will not do what you think that it does. You have to use C cache underscore prefix. Again, C cache man page, but it starts with C cache, not with, not with disk CC. Um, profiling both uh, C cache and disk CC with a subset of your source is a good idea. Uh, the direct mode in C cache actually tokenizes quite a bit of your source code. Um, personally, trying to mix those two together, I still haven't seen a huge win. Um, but that doesn't mean it won't be a huge win for you. Uh, or if you actually invest the time to actually uh, make disk CC better. And if I had more time at those companies, that's, a, that's exactly what would have, my next step would have been is to actually make disk CC better or fork it and make it better. Um, so I'm going to quickly speed through this because we're running out of time. So then we're talking about reducing wickets. We made everything fast, but a lot of overbuilding happens in build systems. A lot. More than people probably like even like really realize. So sources that get that get compiled, that get compiled to object files, but the object files aren't linked in. Um, sources that get recompiled multiple times seemingly for no reason, sometimes due to bugs in make files or weird preprocessor changes. Um, header files that get parsed unnecessarily. And then uh, debug symbols, fat LTO objects, and stuff like that. So unused sources, it's exactly what it sounds like. Sources that get compiled to objects but don't get linked in. Why are they being compiled? Make file cruft. Uh, I, it's the dumbest thing in the world. I've seen it on the, almost every company that I've ever been at, um, where I've done this kind of work before. Um, do a find of star.o, compare it with the link command lines, and look for things that are missing. It's that simple. It, it can be that simple. Um, object files that are linked in, but maybe are eliminated during the linker garbage collection. Maybe, do you even know about linker garbage collection? Uh, 
So even when you do dash WL as needed, that still has to do work to figure out that it doesn't need that crap. And we're all about trying to reduce the amount of work, right? We've made it as fast as possible. We've profile optimized. Now it's just a matter of the fastest thing to do is nothing at all if we don't actually need it. Um, so I'm going to have to skip past this because we're out of time. Uh, so sources that get recompiled, preprocessor stuff, like doing like dash D Linux socket.c and having if def Linux, if def PlayStation 2, if def Win32 all in one file screws you out of a C cache, C cache of anything in that file, even when the code is the same. Taking your common out common stuff and putting it into like an abstract socket source file and then having your platform specific stuff be in platform specific source files allows you to share those things. Uh, really common sense stuff. Some people do dash D version equals as a way to do stuff. You're screwing yourself out of C cache every time that version gets incremented, especially if it's date. Um, a really good example of how to do this properly, in my opinion, is from ScumVM, which is on GitHub. And uh, that's there. No time to go into it. Sources to get recompiled. Uh, that would have been nice to talk about. Uh, moving stuff from header files into source files. If you care about inlining, use LTO. Um, da -da 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 -da. Header files that get reparsed. Reducing disk I.O. If you're using LTO, use a, mo use a modern GCC and enable slim LTO objects. It'll cut the disk I.O. by like more than half. Debug symbols. Do you really need to be generating stabs debug symbol still or cough debug symbol still? Probably not. You can get rid of them and just generate dwarf, uh, probably. Um, and also, don't add unnecessary including link paths. Don't expose things to, to modules that they're not going to use. Um, especially if you're doing it over NFS. Those stat, those stat, uh, stat calls are killer. Uh, shifting the culture. So slow builds means that people play a lot of ping pong. When the builds are fast, people play less ping pong. Most people think it's awesome to, to, to get more work done. Some people don't. Be prepared for the socio-political ramifications of what it means when you actually start to optimize developers' lives. Um, and it's about perfecting, not perfection. There's kind of no end to this. This is like a, 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 a sweater thread you can pull on for quite some time. Um, but it's one of the best, uh, one of the best ROI things. Don't virtualize C++ builds. They're too IOP heavy. Period. VMware and whoever else trying to sell you VMs will tell you different. It's too IOP heavy. Use Linux containers or something, but you need to be running on native hardware. Uh, yeah. So builds can be a lot faster with almost no changes with a very minimal capital investment. It's a fantastic return on investment for medium-sized orgs. Just use this little calculation as your justification for spending time and money. Even in, a, the, even in an org of 20 developers that build once a day and the, and the build's only an hour long, it's about half a million dollars a year. And everyone builds more times than that and has larger orgs than that. So it actually is quite a lot of money being left on the table. And the same math applies for time spent resolving merges, by the way. Um, and this doesn't even factor in opportunity costs that people could be doing more proactive things during that time. So Myler talks, Wednesday at 4.45, pragmatic unit testing in C++. Going to talk about teasing apart dependencies and include files and stuff like that. It's part of that. And then Thursday at 2 p.m. is CTO's guide to modern C++, more operational. How do you grow a C++ engineering team up and down and that kind of stuff. And also, crass, check out my music. Making of the making of on Spotify and iTunes and Amazon MP3. And there's, there's my band camp. And we're out of time. Thank you, guys.